We have a very special guest with us tonight. Um, he's traveled here from a long, long way. And when I think of the word faithfulness, when that word comes to my mind, almost every single time I see that word, I think, think of Kurt and Kendall Kula. Because I have known them for a really, really long time, and they planted and pastored a church in one of the hardest places in the world to um, church plant, and that was in Poland. And they were there for 19 years. Um, really, really tough tough ground, and they were just so incredibly faithful, and the Lord used them, and then he took them from there, and they went to Cambodia, and in Cambodia, God used them in Cambodia for, um, you know, a, a great, great, uh, did a great, great work there as well in Cambodia. They were there eight years, and now they are in the country of Georgia, um, I think the city, I'll, I'll let Kurt tell you the name of the city because I'll butcher it, but um, they're doing a great work there as well, and um, you know, Rob Nash reached out to me and said, hey, the Kulas are going to be in town, isn't that a cool name, Kula? <laughs> Kulas are going to be in town, and um, what about having them share, and we had our schedule all laid out for First Timothy, and the only way that we we're going to be able to finish it in, in our schedule was I said, well, Kurt can come, but he's got to teach First Timothy chapter 6. And it's probably the hardest chapter in the whole uh, book of First Timothy, so we're really, really um, giving it to him tonight, but I'm looking forward to hearing from him. And um, so would you please give a warm Calvary Vista welcome to Pastor Kurt Kula. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Good evening. Good to see you all. So I thought before we got going in the Word, um, I would tell you a little bit about Georgia. Would that be okay? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So let's pray before we begin our evening. Father, we thank you. And uh, thank you for that time of worship. And thank you for the, just the fellowship of the saints tonight, just the, the brothers and sisters, the family of God meeting together tonight. We ask that your Holy Spirit would anoint and pour out the Spirit, fill us, give us understanding of your word, give us a, just a real heart and a fire for the world around us that needs to know you, that needs to know the gospel. We love you, Lord. Pray you bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as uh, Rob said, I'm Kurt Kula and my wife, Kendall, and one of my kids, my, my youngest, Rebecca, is here with us. So if you guys would raise your hands, yeah, over there. So please say hi to them. Um, so Jinso, can we go to slide one? We're going to try to show. That was not it. Okay, there it is. <laughs> yeah, so this is the Georgian flag. Now, does, you know, Georgia, I'll show you the location in a minute. But actually, can anyone here tonight read the top line? Okay. So that's the Georgian language. It's like nothing else in the world. And we say gamarjoba. Can you say gamarjoba? <laughs> that word in Georgian means victory, and it's how they greet each other. So whenever you see somebody in Georgia, you say gamarjoba. And so and that's the Georgian flag. Pretty cool, huh? Got four, five crosses. So they, they, they became a, one of the earliest Christian nations in the world. Armenia was first. I think Georgia might have been second. Um, next slide. So here's where it is. For those of you who didn't know, uh, we're in the yellow here. And the city that we're working in is Tbilisi. Tbilisi, that's the capital. And you can see part of uh, what borders Georgia is the Black Sea. Okay. And we have, um, we have Russia to the north and to the south. We have Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Okay. Then we have the Caspian Sea, and this whole region, Iran is down here to the south, and so this whole region, and even beyond this, is called the Caucasus. And so there's a range of mountains that runs through there called the Caucasus Mountains, and they're some of the tallest mountains in Europe, actually. Um, okay, next slide. Yeah, there it is. So this is the task before us. We've been studying the language, and I feel like I'm dying. I have to tell you, just dying. I don't know why I choose these countries with these crazy languages, but anyway. Uh, fun facts about Georgia. It's one of the oldest in the world, the language. 
It has its own alphabet. It differs from any other language. The Georgian Bible was one of the first secondary versions of the Bible in the world. So your first versions, primary versions, were Syriac, Coptic, Gothic, and Latin. So you take the Hebrew and the Greek, and the first languages they were in were those four languages. But then translated from those languages, Georgia was a secondary version. So it's one of the oldest Bibles, actually, in the world. That's John 3.16. Anybody? $100 tonight if you can read it. Okay. All right. (laughs) Next slide, please. Uh, Fun facts about Georgia. It is considered the birthplace of wine. This is where they trace the history of wine back to, and they... They've found throughout the, the country and the, the entire region, Azerbaijan and Armenia included, these um, places where they used to, to bury grapes in the ground and ferment. And so this is considered the official birthplace of wine. They're very proud about their vineyards. You know, every family has their own homemade wine and stuff. So they're really, it's famous in that region. Okay, next slide. Ah, the food is great. The food is wonderful. And so, um, yeah, this is, um, these are some of the cool foods. So you see this guy here on the side, that's a store right by our house. That's like two minutes from our house where we go to buy bread every week. And this guy is cooking Georgian bread, puri. And, um, and so you can see it's on the inside of a clay oven and they cook it right on the side. And uh, one loaf costs about 25 cents and it's so good. And the biggest problem is just gaining weight. Because, I mean, this bread is fresh every day, and you just go in, and it's waiting for you. This is called, um, this is called hachapuri, and this is also Georgian bread with cheese in it, and then you break an egg on top, you know, and then you mix it around, and you eat it, and it is so good. Everybody loves it that tries it. Um, they have their own dumpling. It's called kinkali, and so it's just a, a regular dumpling, kind of like a ravioli or a pierogi or something, and you've got pork in it. And it's filled with juice, and um, everybody loves kinkali. And they also like to cook a lot with pomegranate and walnut and, um, help me out, honey, Um, cilantro. They use a lot of cilantro. Yeah, so they're really into their nuts. And um, I like to say the Georgian people are a little nuts, but um, they're they're actually a lot of fun. Um, So I could go on and on about the food. All right, next slide. Um, Some of the tallest mountains in Europe are actually here in Georgia, and this picture we took. So we were standing right here and took this picture. That's a a very old um, Orthodox church on top of a hill, and it's kind of the famous image of Georgia that you see on a lot of their stationery and things like that. You can see the town at the base of the mountains, right? Okay, next slide. Not so fun facts. Um, the birth of Joseph Stalin, about 45 minutes from our house. Um, yeah, 1878. He was born Yoseb Yugashvili in Georgia. He was a cobbler, uh, to a cobbler and a house cleaner. He moved to Tbilisi, where we worked, to go to seminary. And while in seminary, he embraced Marxism and became a student of Lenin, if you can imagine. He was in seminary when that happened. Um, And so this is the house where he was born. They don't, they're not proud of that fact, but they don't deny it. So you can go see the house. You can see the place where he was born. They don't erase their history, right? They they just let it speak for itself. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, the war effort. So we, Kendall and I and Rebecca, we moved there about, almost about two years ago. And... um, We didn't know why the Lord was calling us there. We had been in Cambodia for eight years. We knew that we were finishing up our work in Cambodia, and we were praying about what was next. And Jed, Pastor Jed Gorley, had planted Calvary Chapel Tbilisi. And so he was just asking for help. And so we prayed and prayed, prayed about two years about making this move. And um, as we came home, closing up shop in Cambodia, we were considering Georgia, and it just seemed like the Lord opened the doors for that, so we went. And um, God gathered a team of missionaries, Calvary Chapel missionaries, and um, what was kind of cool was this team of missionaries, most of them were from Ukraine, but they were all seasoned kind of that, missionaries that had been out 25, 30 years. And so um, we didn't know what the Lord was doing, but then the war started. 
And so Jed, um, all of these guys that I work with, they were pretty much grew up in Ukraine. And so they had personal friends and family and church members that were, they were trying to rescue out of Ukraine when the war started. And I realized real quick why I was there because all of a sudden I was running the whole Bible school and I was actually pastoring the church because Jed was literally sitting behind the computer 20, almost 24-7. I mean, he was just behind this thing um, all day doing Google Maps with uh, U.S. Army intelligence, former U.S. Army intelligence here in the States and six different groups plotting troop movements, figuring out how to find tunnels and areas to get Ukrainians out and to rescue them. And he did not leave his computer screen. I mean, we had to bring food to him because uh, uh, we actually rescued, helped rescue 15 orphans that were being carried away into Russia. To, they were going to make them Russian citizens. They are forcing, you know, they're taking people into Russia and forcing them to be Russian citizens. And so um, these kids, they took them out of the orphanage with just the clothes on their backs. Some of them didn't even have shoes on their feet. And it took a, a couple of months, but they finally rescued these kids and brought them to Tbilisi. And the whole story was on CBS News, or was it CBS or ABC? One of, the, one of the news networks, you know? So you can even go on YouTube and see that story about these kids. Now a couple of those kids are coming to our church. Um, so what's interesting about this picture is, so the surgeon, one of the things that we were doing in the war effort is we were literally buying, going to Georgian pharmacies, buying like $40,000 worth of medicine, boxing it, sending it, getting it to Poland and having it driven in on trucks, trucks that Calvary Chapel, probably some of the, the money of people in this church that supported the effort used, we bought trucks and we got supplies in. And this guy was a, was a surgeon, Ukrainian surgeon. He didn't have anything. He needed materials. He needed tools. And we got him his tools so he could do critical surgeries during the war. Um, this is some of our team boxing things up. That's Pastor Jed right there and Renee. They've been there eight years. Um, that's Brother Samir. He's from Lebanon. <laughs> He's studying um, medicine. And um, you can see the generators. Another thing we did was, so obviously they're without infrastructure. So we bought several of these generators and um, got them into people and places to, to help people have electricity. Um, in this picture here, we did a, in our church office in Tbilisi, we did a, um, just a clothing distribution, like you've probably done them here at the church. What was amazing about this is all of these Ukrainian people came, and this woman that my wife is standing next to, I think, I'm not sure if she was, but several of the women and the people in there were, were doctors, um, college professors, super successful business people, they're walking out of the clothing distribution in it with clothes piled this high because they had no clothes for their kids. And so here one day they're living these completely prosperous, incredible lives, successful at the top of their game, and the next day they've got nothing except the clothes on their back, literally. And they're walking out of a clothing distribution so happy. We had a church, if you can imagine, a Calvary Chapel church in Tokyo sent us 20 boxes of clothes. So you can see the, how the Calvary chapels, and not just Calvary, but all the Christian churches were working together to meet these needs. And it was really quite incredible. And they were happy to have these clothes, secondhand clothes, you know, if you can imagine. And so this lady right here, I think, was a doctor. Um, next slide. Uh, that's our church. And... When Kendall and I went two summers ago, we had about 40 people in the church, you know, and then bam, there it is, you know, 180, 200 people just exploded, you know, and um, we've got 13 different nationalities. When we do, I was telling Pastor Rob, when we do our messages, Jed or me or whoever preaches in English, we have Georgian translation, we have a, a sister in the church named Anya sits in the front row with a headset on, does Russian translation. So we have about 40 or 50 people listening in Russian. We've got Farsi translation. The biggest problem in our church is which language do you speak? I mean, literally, you're talking to people and you're like, okay, wait, no, she doesn't speak, she speaks, no, she speaks Farsi, you know, and, or he, or, you know, but it's a lot of fun. And so I put up these two verses, and these are some of the things the Lord's putting on our hearts 
Um, then our mouths was was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. We have in our church Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians sitting next to each other, lifting their hands in praise to our God. You know, the governments, they'll never figure it out. But Christian people, we will figure it out. We have figured it out. And I, when you see a Ukrainian and Russian praying together for God to end the war, that touches your heart. It really touches your heart. My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations. And that's what we're asking God to do with Calvary and Tbilisi, that he would make our, our church a house of prayer for all the nations. All right. And one more, I think. Um, just some of our outreaches. One of the things that this is our house where we live. Fun fact about our house. We, so we have a, you know, it's a normal apartment. Um, what do we have? Two rooms, um, a living room, two bedrooms, kitchen. And we have like 11 different kinds of wallpaper. I mean, every wall has a different color of wallpaper. I don't know what is up with that. But it's really, you know, you just, it's kind of cool in one way because you just don't think about anything, any decor. You don't worry about anything anymore. You're like, oh, nothing matches anyway. You know, it doesn't matter. So... But we have, a, we have a home study in our house. Um, that's David, one of the other pastors, and I were baptizing there. Um, Kendall is helping um, a guy named Georgi, which is George, Georgi. Uh, that's like John in, a, in English. Georgi is the most popular name in, in Georgia. And um, with, we have a, an English outreach that Jed and Renee started about, I don't know, probably since the time they were there. And it's become really well known in the city and through this English outreach, we're seeing a lot of people come to church. And um, this far picture over here, the, the outreach that we're doing, that's in an Azerbaijani village. So everybody in that village is Azerbaijani. And that's a moderate Muslim culture. And <clears throat> we had an outreach, a Christmas outreach, where a bunch of these kids came to Tbilisi, and we did a whole Christmas celebration with them. And for the first time in their lives, they they heard the story of Jesus' birth. And the, their teacher that's teaching them in their after-school studies, she read the story herself in Turkish language to them. And for the first, she's reading the Bible in Turkish, the story of Christ's birth, and it's the first time they're ever hearing it. And uh, these Azerbaijani, they're just wonderful people. And, um, you know, again, Muslim, but wide open, always asking us spiritual questions. I really think God wants to do something in Azerbaijani. Um, yeah. And we have Calvary Chapel Bible College Eurasia. So if anybody wants to come to Bible school in Tbilisi, we invite you. Um, so here's a few pictures from our last semester. We've got people from all over the place. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And the last slide, that's us. <laughs> so there it is yeah so keep us in prayer uh, one of our big prayer needs there is we need a building so the building that you saw our church meeting in we don't have it anymore and we're we're kind of like the church on wheels right now so we could really use god to provide just some place for us to meet and have on a regular basis because we have it's you know I mean, I know that the churches here in the United States are much bigger, but there, 200 is big, and it's hard to move 200 people around <laughs> to a new location, you know, every month. So you can imagine that problem. So if you would just please pray for God's provision for us in that way, we'd be grateful. Amen? Amen. I'm going to get some water here, and then we're going to get into 1 Timothy 6. Rob is lying about me having to finish the book. This chapter has a lot to do with money, and he didn't want to say it. So he gave it to me, and he says you have to tithe more. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, did, he didn't say it. <laughs> no, it's a great, great study. Paul writing to Timothy, as you know, if you've been coming to this study, um, and this, he's a young pastor in the church, and Paul's coming, really more second Timothy, but he's coming to, towards the end of his ministry, and he's really trying to equip Timothy and tell him everything that he needs to know to grab the baton from Paul and to continue the work of the gospel. 
And uh, we come to the, the, the conclusion of his first letter to Timothy. And he's giving uh, Timothy advice regarding different kinds of people in the church. And chapter 6 is a, just another exhortation. So as we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, I think what I'd like to do is just kind of go in a verse-by-verse verse fashion. But let's read the first two verses. He says, All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. All right. So he says, let all those who are under the yoke as slaves regard their masters. Paul addresses those in the church who are slaves. Slavery, as you know, was an accepted norm in the Roman Empire, and Paul was not on a campaign to convince the Roman government that it was wrong. Um, I am sure he would have changed things if he could have. But he tells us how he felt about it actually in 1 Corinthians 7. So we're going to flip around a little bit tonight and look at some verses. So 1 Corinthians 7. Paul's just kind of sharing his heart about the whole slavery issue in here. And he says, um, each man must remain in that condition in, what you, in which he was called. Verse 21, were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Don't get yourself in a situation where you become a slave. Right? That's good advice for us today. We don't want to be enslaved to anybody financially and morally in any kind of way. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. So uh, that's Paul's heart. He's, he's basically telling them, okay, this is a reality in our life. In, the, in those times, the times they were living in, don't worry about it. Focus on glorifying God. It wasn't an easy, easy issue to deal with. I think it's fascinating that the Bible, in the Bible, we have a letter from Paul to a slave owner named Philemon, begging him to lay down his right as a slave owner and reconcile with Onesimus, his runaway slave, but not on the basis of Roman law, but on the basis of the gospel. He's not appealing to Roman law. He's appealing to the gospel, and he's talking to Philemon, and he's saying, receive this brother, but receive him not just as your slave, but as more than a slave, as a brother in Jesus Christ. Now that both slaves and masters, you think about it in the early church, are worshiping side by side. And that's a really interesting dynamic. How should the church think about these things? So his perspective was the eternal kingdom perspective. Um, the gospel, I, I like to say, is the great equalizer of men. God doesn't see as man sees, nor does he judge the way that we do. He sees the heart. So whatever or whoever we are on earth, in the eyes of men, is not going to matter to Christ in the kingdom. And I think there's going to be some real surprises in heaven, you know, of the rewards passed out when Jesus comes back to reward us for our works. And there's going to be people that are being highly rewarded that maybe here on earth were regarded as very low, but in God's mind, they're very high. God is not interested in, in you know, if whether we were, you know, a gardener or a famous brain physician, you know, a brain surgeon right? To him, that doesn't matter. He's always looking at the heart of man. He's always looking at what's in our hearts and how we worship God, how we know God, and how we walk with God. In fact, as far as I understand the New Testament, the only way to really impress God is by believing him. The Bible says in Hebrews that it's impossible to please him without what? Faith, yeah. So God's not looking at our resume. He's not looking at our IQ. 
He's not looking at how much money we earn or don't earn. He's looking at our faith. And a poor person or a hardworking assembly, assembly line worker at Ford's in Detroit or a famous physician or lawyer or judge doesn't matter. What do you have in your heart? Is it faith in God? That brings a smile to the face of God when we believe him. That's what he's looking for. That means every one of us in this room tonight can be pleasing to God. Every one of us can move his heart and bring a smile to his face by trusting in him. And that's the way God's going to judge on Judgment Day. And Paul wants the church to realize that, okay, we can't change the slavery thing, you know, but, hey, let's be a witness. And um, what a powerful witness that would have been to the Roman world seeing masters treating their slaves like dignified employees and those employees working hard for their masters, right? But Paul's telling the slaves, he's saying, look, you doesn't, yeah, they're a believer, but that doesn't change anything. You work hard for them. Be a witness, right? And we want to have that same attitude in our work today. Maybe some of you are employers and maybe some of you are employees, but a part of our witness is the way we work. A part of the message we send to the world is our work ethic. and so important in the body of Christ. Now, in a democratic country where policy is shaped by the people, right, like the United States of America or England, right, the church should have a voice on this hideous business, right? Slavery is not something we should accept, right? We're Christians and we live in a land where the government is for the people and by the people. So we have a place in our government to change things, right? England has that. So you look at history and you, you go back to the 1800s and you've got Wilberforce in England, right? And that guy is laying down 20 years of his life to, to stop the slave trade in the East Indies, right? William Wilberforce, if you haven't read his biography, read it. If you haven't, have you seen the movie Amazing Grace? Yeah, it's an excellent movie. Rent it, find it, watch it. Watch what this man went through to put an end to slavery. Lincoln in the United States of America and many others, not just Lincoln, right? They went through a lot to end this hideous practice, right? We, should, we shouldn't think that it's okay. The Bible doesn't teach that it's okay. It's just that Paul was in a situation where they were under the Roman rule and Rome wasn't going to change it, okay? So, Going on, verse 3 through 5. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. <laughs> Boy, Paul doesn't really hold back any punches, does he? He's calling these guys godless and depraved. He's not even being nice. So, Isaiah 8.20 says this. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They're not walking in the light. So Paul's saying, I'm laying down clear teaching, clear doctrine. If somebody doesn't agree with it, you know, um, they're just men of depraved mind. They just want to be controversial. They want to have arguments. Um, <clears throat> These kinds of people, they use the word to argue and debate rather than to grow in their relationship with Christ, rather than to encourage, rather than to build other people up. The word becomes for them something to help them be right. And they want to always be right. And so they're always arguing about something. Uh, their doctrine was carnal. It got people angry at each other and divided them. Uh, these types of people come into the church and continually stir the pot. They want to talk about something controversial and get people debating. But that's not why we're here. We're not here to have controversy and to debate. We're here to learn the doctrine of God and to worship God and to help each other out on our journey to heaven, right? 
We're on our way to heaven. We're Christians. We don't need to come into the church to have controversy. Yeah, there's things that are hard to understand that we need to discuss, and sometimes debate is healthy. But that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about people who thrive on debate, who thrive on controversy, who thrive on di division and argumentation. That's not to be the attitude that we have. They're not happy unless they're arguing with someone about something. And the King James, how many of you are reading a new King James tonight? Yeah, so you have an added phrase that I didn't have in mind, but from such withdraw yourself, right? Yeah, you see that? So if they're unwilling, if you meet somebody like that in the church and they're unwilling to submit to the clear teaching and the doctrine that leads to godliness or God-likeness, Christ-likeness, Paul's just saying avoid them. Take a step back, pray. If you can't talk to them and every conversation you have turns into an argument, just back up, pray for them, allow God to work, but don't waste time trying to change them and don't give them a platform to be heard. Uh, if necessary, the elders of the church may even have to remove such a person, right? Um, so that's what he's talking about. Um, have you ever met anybody like this? <laughs> yeah, I have. Oh my, it is exhausting. It's just exhausting. And I could tell you stories and you could tell me stories, but this is to be our approach. You know, you try to reason, but if you can't, take a step back, pray, and don't give that person a platform. You know, pray for him. Um, let's keep going. Verse 6 through 11. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. So these guys are trying to gain for themselves, all right? They're trying to, to get a following. They're trying to get control in some way. They're on some kind of a trip. They want something. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we, can take, we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God and woman of God, <laughs> and pursue righteousness Godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So godliness with contentment is great gain. So let me ask you a question. What do you think? Do you think verse 8, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Do you think verse 8 describes most people in the church today? You do? I see some saying yes, confidently. I like it. I see some saying no, confidently. You're probably right too. There's a lot of people that I think in our country where verse 8 doesn't describe them. They're not content with food and clothing, right? Because everything around us is telling us that we need to have more and we need to have the, the latest phone. We need to have, you know, um, the newest car. We need to have the latest fashion. Man, I saw it in Europe all the time too when we lived in Poland. The new fashion would come out and all of the women would be out buying the latest thing. You had to have it, you know, and it would just change. And it, it seemed to be changing so fast from year to year. There was like a new fashion. And um, it doesn't matter if you're a poor country or a rich country. Contentment is something that we all have to learn. And it doesn't matter if you're personally poor or you're a person of means. We have to learn contentment. I think it's sometimes it's harder for wealthier people. Um, but... I think what Paul is trying to say is that there is a peace and a rest that fills our hearts when we realize God is the one who is actually taking care of us. When you finally believe that God is really the one taking care of you, right? Yeah, he, we, we need to work hard. We need to be diligent. We need to, we can't, we're not supposed to be lazy, right? I'm not, but at the end of the day, as Christians, we really have to come to a place in our lives where we believe God is taking care of us. God is providing for us. The Bible says God gives us the ability to make money. Right? 
And so those of you who are great businessmen and women, and maybe you're even people of means, you're fairly wealthy, you know, you need to understand God gave you that ability, right? And with that, rebel- uh, that ability, there's a responsibility, right, to share, right? I'm not talking about communism here. We, I'm not talking about Stalin, <laughs> okay? I don't agree with that. But I'm talking about God gives us talents. And one of those talents is I, I've been personally blessed to know several Christian businessmen you know, that had just are so generous in what they do with their finances. And they give and they give and they give. And it's amazing to see these. They're going to have such reward in heaven, you know. And um, the church has been blessed by these people, right? And so that's a gift. Um, over and over again as a missionary, I've seen God do things for, and my wife and I, we've seen God do things for us we could never do for ourselves, I even have a recent example I've been kind of sharing, and I, it, I've shared it a few times, but I'm so excited about it. So we have Rebecca, who's going into university, and um, I have another daughter, Olivia, who's in her senior year, and they're, they're gonna, both going to be at Cal Baptist in Riverside. Well, you guys probably know, Cal Baptist is a private school, and it's not cheap. And so here I am as a missionary, and I'm thinking, how do, Lord, how do we get kids through college? It's ridiculous. I mean, when I was going to school, I went to Michigan State. When I was going to school, you could go a whole year and live on campus for 6000 bucks. It's $50,000 a year to go to Cal Baptist. That's insane. But so... We pray, Lord, part of the reason why we go there is they have a third culture kid program. And a third culture kid is a kid who is American but never lived in America before. So if you talk to Rebecca, she looks like a typical American, but she's not. She's never lived in America. She doesn't think like an American. She doesn't. What's natural and normal to the kid going up through high school in the States is not natural and normal to her, you know? And that's true of missionary kids. And so they have a program there to help these kids because there's a lot of missionary kids that go to school there. And um, so anyway, we pray and we, we feel like this is the best place for her to transition. We don't want her to go to a school where she's going to be hearing all kinds of crazy things taught, as you know what's going on in some of the schools. And so, um, Lord, you got to provide. So we do the aid, we do all that stuff, you know, and God is providing, they get scholarships, but it's still a lot. So it's a lot for one, but now I got two. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I'm just a missionary. How am I going to come up with that? And um, so, you know, the, the, the numbers are, ca- are coming down, but it's starting to get affordable, but I'm kind of sweating it, getting on the plane in Georgia, coming back to the States. We're going to get Rebecca in school, and I'm thinking, how, Lord, how am I going to do two kids? And the Lord's just saying, I took care of you with one. Do you think two's like impossible for me? You know, what, what amount of money can I not provide? And so I'm thinking, yeah, you're right. Why am I worrying? Why do I have to learn this lesson over and over again in my life? Not to worry. But I was worrying. And so sure enough, like two weeks ago, you know, nothing's changed. I'm just, just trying to figure out, you know, how to get them through. And Olivia, my older daughter, she sends, she calls us on the phone. We're in Indiana. And she says, you know what? You'd never believe it. Cal Baptist, they just gave me a double major scholarship, and I'm not even a double major. And they said they wanted to give it to me anyway, and it's going to be more than usual. So usually it's like maybe $3,000 or something like that for the year. It was like $9,500. Her school is like totally paid for, except for like $1,700, which she already had from working. So She's not, she's paid off for the whole year. Who can do that? I mean, it's like we're sitting here going, we're never going to get there, but we're serving God and we're going to keep serving God. And if she can't go, she doesn't go, right? But God says, no, they're going. And he doesn't just do that for missionaries. Missionaries experience that because we ask God. We beg him, Lord, you got to do something. But sometimes people that haven't gone, where you're not used to asking God for everything that you need, you don't ask. 
God wants the whole family to ask him. He doesn't just provide for this person. You're missionaries. This country's crazy. If we, if, if we moved back to the United States of America, you want to know something? We'd have to, it's like missionary, we'd have to relearn how to be missionaries in the United States. It's changed so much in the 30 years we've been gone. You're missionaries. You're here tonight. You care about God's word. You care about the gospel. You're listening to me blab about Georgia, and you're, you're actually interested. That's cool. God wants to provide for you too, and he will provide for you, but you got to ask. you got to believe that he wants to provide for you. And when we learn that, when we learn that God, if I put first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'm really putting Jesus first in my life, my personal time, my time serving in the church, my time at work, if I'm putting Christ first, God promises to provide. He doesn't want us worrying about this stuff. And if he's given you the ability to make money, do it. But be careful. Be careful because money is the root of what? All sorts of evil, right? The idea isn't money is evil. The idea is money is the root of all kinds of evil, okay? I've seen the reality of verse 9 lived out in Poland, the first, the first mission field where we lived. We had a small church in a, t in a town called Lublin. And some of our very good friends, they had been Christian for years. They were some of the first Christians in that city. Um, a lot of fellowship was happening at their house. This guy, my friend Jack, I'll call him, he was a very successful businessman. He had a, a small fruit distribution business, and the company was growing. And, um, you know, we had so many Bible studies at his house, and um, those guys, they were just such a blessing to the church. But his business was taking off. And it became a multi-million dollar business. And the thing with it was that the more money that he had, the more, the bigger his business grew, the more important he became, you know. And then it was, the temptation wasn't even money. You know what it was? It was power. He started messing around on his wife. You know, marriage ends. He's got the biggest house in Lublin, you know, but his marriage is over. You know, doesn't even go to church anymore, doesn't even care about God. This is a guy that was like a pillar in the church, but money is the root of all sorts of evil. His life, spiritual life is destroyed. And it really wasn't about even so much needing to have more money. It was being tempted with pride. He became prideful. And pride is really the root of all sin, isn't it? And that's what money will do. Maybe you're not, it's not the dollar amount or anything like that that tempts you, but it's pride. Oh, look at what I have. Right? And that's what happened to him, and it ruined his life. It literally ruined his life. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one or love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Yeah, um, in verse 11, he says, but flee these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So run away from the things that can destroy you and run to that which will supply your faith and give you an eternal reward. All right? One day we're going to stand before God, and we want to stand before God, and we want to enter heaven with an abundance. And when Jesus comes back, and he's coming soon, he doesn't want any of us to be ashamed. He doesn't want, when Jesus comes, if he comes tonight, he doesn't want any of us saying, I'm not ready. He doesn't want any of us saying, oh, I'm doing that. I never stopped doing that. Your spirit, Holy Spirit convicted me and told me not to do, but I'm, he doesn't want us to be ashamed. He doesn't want us to be in sin. He wants us to be pursuing love, pursuing faith, Pursuing righteousness. You know, we went to see, did you guys see that movie, Sound of Freedom? Uh, incredible movie. We saw it in Indiana. Really well done. Um, but <clears throat> before that movie came on, they had the previews. What do they call them? The um, trailers. And in Indiana, the trailer they showed was this, no, the trailer they showed was this new movie that came out. I don't even want, know the name. And I'm glad I don't. 
But it's just, it was the whole basis of the movie was these kids that were getting into this demonic thing where they were um, entering into this, I don't know, um, spirit guide thing and literally becoming possessed by demons. It's this new movie that's out. And so you, there's like this hand thing, right? And they have to grab the hand, right? And then they open up their heart to this demonic realm and then their, their lives. And I, it was a three-minute trailer and I was turning my head and it was, Kendall and I were like turning ahead and saying, don't look, man, let's just get up and leave. It was that bad, three-minute trailer. It was so dark. Then I'm, I, I just couldn't believe it. So then I'm talking to my daughter, Rebecca, and she says, yeah, she read a story in the news about it. Kids are going to watch the movie and they're passing out during the movie. They're getting demon-possessed right in the movie. They're getting filled with demons. Pursue righteousness. Pursue love. Pursue helping people. We're entertaining ourselves to death. And Satan knows it. So he gives us three things. In the rest of the chapter, we're going to see three good things that we need to do. Okay, let's read it first, 12 all the way to the end, and then we'll go through it. He says, fight the good fight of faith. So as you're going through, if you're reading your Bible and you're taking notes, go ahead and underline every place you see the word good. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, uh, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be the honor and the eternal dominion. Amen. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited, or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. We'll stop at 19. Did you underline all the goods? Yeah. So the first thing that Paul tells us to do is fight the good fight of faith. That's a great sentence, isn't it? Fight the good fight of faith. How many of you thought about faith as a fight? Yeah, probably, yeah, <laughs> some people are raising their hand. Yeah, it's a fight, isn't it? What is the good fight of faith? It's the fight for men's souls in the advancement of the gospel. It's the fight against Satan and the kingdom of darkness and as many snares he lays to take people captive. It's the fight to stay true to God and not to allow the world to get us marching to the beat of Satan's drum, right? To the beat of the drum of the world. There are a lot of Christians out there that don't even realize they're in a fight. It's hard to win a fight when you don't even realize you're in it. We're in a fight. Like a heavyweight champion in the title fight, we're to be fully focused on the prize, right? If you're in the ring and you're fighting the heavy, you're in your title fight, title bout, right? You're, there's only one thing you're thinking about, and that's winning, scoring as many points as you can and, and beating the opponent. The Bible calls it single-mindedness. Paul is saying, stop with all the worldly stuff and get in the ring. Christian, get in the fight. When, when people pray for us, when we're out on the mission field and we're trying to do God's work and people pray for us, we feel it. Prayer makes the difference in all of the work we do. We're, we're no different than you are. But when people care, when people read the newsletters, when people pray, people pray, things happen out on the mission field all the time. But when people don't pray, not much gets done. If I were to do Poland all over again, I felt like Poland was a really, like Rob said, it was a really hard place. I would just get a massive amount of people praying for us. 
you know, because I felt like that's what that country needs. It needs a lot, a lot of people praying for it so that a spiritual breakthrough can happen. Right? Now, you may not be called to go, but if you're called to be in, in, in the body of Christ, you're called to pray for someone, somewhere. Your prayer today, tonight, could change the life of some little African kid you'll never meet. He could become the next Billy Graham. And literally tens of thousands of people could come to Christ through his life because you prayed, you interceded. You could be, have a reward through that kid's life. Faith has a rippling effect to it. Faith is like taking a stone and throwing it in the water and the, the waves go out and out and out. When every time we obey God in our lives, every time God says, pray, stop and pray, and we pray, we throw a stone in the water and you have no idea where that wave ends. That one stone, that, that 10, 15, half an hour of prayer, that could result in a changed life in China. You know, you pray for this guy. His life gets radically touched or saved. He shares the gospel with someone. That person becomes a missionary. They go to China, and somebody's getting saved in China because you stopped when God told you to pray. You were on the 405. <laughs> God said, turn off the radio. Spend the next 20 minutes in this traffic jam praying. You're fighting the good fight of faith. That's faith. That faith can change the world. But you have to see it. You have to know that the spiritual reality. The Bible calls it single-mindedness. Learn how to pray. Share your faith. Invest in the kingdom of God. Grab hold of eternal life. Be shrewd in the matters of the kingdom. Be, you know, shrewd. When you think of shrewd, that's not really a positive word, is it? <laughs> shrewd. It's like Scrooge, right? Like, be Scrooges <laughs> when it comes to earthly mammon. In other words, take it and use it for God's glory. Learn how to do that. One of the things that I've realized about money as a missionary is I never, we've in, tw in 30 years of being missionaries, we've never asked for it in a newsletter. We've never ever told somebody what we've needed. And God has always provided. And he's used people to in his provision. Um, and um, I just realized that, well, I'm not going to go that way. <laughs> I was just thinking about something, but I, I just decided I, I, I wouldn't go that way. But I guess what I want to say about it is just that God can do things for us that we could never do for ourselves. But when we pray and we ask God, he provides. Yeah. Um, number two, make the good confession. So fight the good fight of faith. Number two, make the good confession. That's also in verse 12 and through, uh, down through verse 13 there. So it's like 13 through 16. You made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So in chapter 3, verse 16, Paul reminds us of the confession that he made, he says, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So that was a, a confession that Paul made. Um, in verse 13, he mentions, I charge you in the presence of God, back in chapter six, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. So think about that. Jesus was standing before Pilate, and he said, you say correctly that I'm a king, for I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Jesus stood before Pilate, and he made the good confession. Pilate answered, what is truth? What is truth? Jesus confessed openly that he was a king, and if you wanted to come into his kingdom, you have to love truth. You cannot enter the kingdom of God loving lies. You have to love truth. That's the good confession. In Romans 10, 9, Paul tells us that if we, that, um, he tells us that if we confess, 
If we want to be saved, we have to confess with our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. So we have to make a confession with our mouth. When he comes, we don't want to be ashamed of his coming. Um, so we have to make that confession. But notice verse 14, he says, and you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? That you keep the commandment without stain or reproach. A part of our confession is also our behavior. So we have to confess with our mouth. We have to make the good confession. We should not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, right? Don't be ashamed. Make the confession. But a part of our confession is our behavior. We're not to bring a stain or reproach to the name of Jesus in anything we do or say until Jesus comes again. Boy, that convicts me. I think about my driving. See, I don't drive in Georgia, and then I come back to California, and I have to drive, and I'm like, how, do, how does anybody drive without sinning? You know, I don't get it. Like, I'm thinking about the good confession here. I'm in trouble. The, no, you know what I'm saying, right? We need to be full of the Spirit every day <laughs> just to get in our car and go somewhere. Um, so, but that's what he's talking about. Our behavior is a part of our confession. Now, this is really fascinating in verse 15 and 16 which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords. So he's talking about God, right? He's talking about God the Father there, right? Because he's saying that you will keep the commandment without stain or reproach till the appearing of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords, Lord of Lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be the honor and eternal dominion. Now, I just want to take a moment with you to really talk about this verse. Paul just begins praising the Lord, but it's a crystal clear declaration of the deity of Jesus Christ, isn't it? That Jesus Christ is God. It couldn't be any clearer. God is the only sovereign but he's also the king of kings and lord of lords. Who else is called king of kings and lord of lords? Jesus. Who can tell me where? Where do we read that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords in the New Testament? Which book? Revelation. That's right. It's in Revelation 17, and it's in Revelation 19. All right. The name written upon his thigh is king of kings and lord of lords when he's coming back and he's going to return. So God is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus the Son is the King of kings and Lord of lords, okay? Now notice verse 16. It says, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Okay, this is also interesting. Turn over to the book of Revelation. We're almost finished. Hang in there. It's a few more minutes. Revelation 4. And let's just look at this phrase a little bit. This is the... In the book of Revelation, we get the message to the seven churches. Then before the tribulation starts, we get caught up into heaven with John, right? And so Revelation 4 and 5 is before the throne of God in heaven. And notice Revelation 4, verse 9 and 11. It says, and when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor, power, honor and power, for you created all things and because of, of your will they existed and were created. It's talking about God, isn't it? To him be honor and dominion and glory. Now turn over to chapter 5. Rome, uh, Revelation 5, verse 12 and 13. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. All right. 
you can't say that Jesus is any, anyone less than God because God doesn't share his honor and dominion and glory with anyone, right? And here it goes to the lamb and to the one who sits on the throne, right? So there it is, just a little apologetic for you that Jesus is God. God shares his honor and glory with no one. So God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right? That's why we believe the Trinity. All right, finally, number three. Number one, we were to fight the good fight. Number two, make the good confession. Number three, be rich in good works. Be rich in good works. We see it in 17 through 19 of 1 Timothy 6. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. We're to fix our hope completely on Jesus Christ, the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1. We're to use our free time, our resources, to be rich in good works. Paul's letter to Titus, which I assume Pastor Rob is going to get to, um, next, I don't know what, what the program, the teaching program is, but that letter is a, a treatise on the role of good works in the life of a believer. So when you, as you go through Titus, you'll see the role of, and the emphasis of good works in the Christian life. Good works don't save us, but they do supply our salvation and keep us in the will of God. So it's really good to do good. We're not saved by doing good, but we do good because we are saved. And you know what? Doing good is just a lot of fun. I mean, if you're depressed and you're down or you're not feeling good about yourself, man, one of the greatest cures for depression is to go and do good for somebody else. That'll snap you out of depression so fast. It'll encourage you. You'll just feel like you were the tool in the hands of God in that person's life, and you were, right? Doing good is one of the greatest cures for depression, I'm telling you. It really is. Verse 19 is teaching us to store up our treasure in heaven. Again, so much time in, in Western culture, not just here, is entertaining ourselves and accomplishing goals that in eternity won't last. So we can spend all of our time trying to do these things that for eternity won't matter. But doing good will matter. Jesus teaches us um, to do good in, in the Sermon on the Mount, too. Um, look at Luke chapter 12. So Luke 12, you also see this in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Luke 12, I want to look at verse 32 through 34. This is Jesus. He says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Verse 33, sell your possessions, give to charity, make yourselves money belts which do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We had a missionary friends that just moved to South Africa. Did you know that like in Johannesburg and some of these places, they're some of the most dangerous cities in the world? And they, they moved there. The first week they got there, they went to church on Sunday. Somebody beat down the door of their house, literally, and the gate coming into their property and went in their house and took all of their, uh, all the family's laptops and devices, took everything. First week they were there. I had a friend, we had an acquaintance that visited us in Poland that was from, I can't remember which place in South Africa. His house had been robbed 17 times. Some of the times they were in the house. It was just armed robberies. 17 times. You know, you live in South Africa, you don't believe anything you have is yours, <laughs> right? And so it's true. That's the reality. We don't experience that here as much, but it's the truth. Hey, store up your treasure in heaven. 
The idea is don't hold on to your stuff. Don't, don't put your hope in stuff. Keep your hope anchored in the return of Jesus Christ. When God gives you stuff, use it for his glory. Finally, let's just read the last two verses, and then we'll, we'll, have, um, we'll ask Pastor Rob to come up to pray for us. Um, Paul says here, he charges Timothy in this letter. He says, oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. So Paul gives Timothy one final reminder not to get dragged into the arguments of these arrogant men who claim to have knowledge, but it's really a false knowledge, and to guard the truth which was imparted to him. I like that. Guard the truth, right? Guard it. God's given us something. He's given us his word. He's given us the gospel. Guard it. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Man, and and there's so much stuff blowing through the church, isn't there? There's so many new teachings and so much stuff being said. But here, for many of you have been sitting here for years, and Pastor, the, the, the teachers in the church have been giving you this precious truth that Paul was giving Timothy. Guard it. Value it. Put it in your most expensive box and hold on to it and value it and guard it. Don't let the enemy and don't let anybody take away these truths from you because this is reality. Heaven is real. Jesus is real. (laughs) Jesus is coming back to bring us there. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. Hey, Kendall and Rebecca, why don't you guys come up here too? Thanks, buddy. You're welcome. (laughs) All right. Why don't we stand? And um, if you would, just stretch your arms out as we pray over these guys. Father, we thank you so much for the Kendall family, or for the Kula family, for Kurt, Kendall, Rebecca, And God, we thank you for, um, Lord, I thank you just for the testimony that they have been to me of of just faithfulness to you, faithful to the call that you've put upon their life and and their heart, and Lord, the way that you have used them in in so many places, And, And Lord, we rejoice in just the report tonight of what you're doing in Georgia. And God, we pray, first of all, that you would um, give the church um, a building. Lord, that you would just literally open up a door that no man can shut for the church to be able to meet. And Lord, I want to pray big that you would literally give them a building, that it wouldn't be something that they would rent but it would be something that they would possess, that they would own, that they could um, just meet in every single day of the week and that your word would just continue to go forth there in power and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray um, just for the work at the Bible College, that you would um, continue to bring students from all over the region um, that can be raised up to be sent out, that more churches could get planted and Lord, I pray for Kurt as he is one of the pastors there at the church and teaching and sharing and discipling that, Lord, you'd give him wisdom. Um, I pray, God, that you would just continue to, to work through him. I pray you'd continue to, to just create an amazing um, unity amongst the pastoral team there. Lord, I pray for Kendall and her ministry with the women and the girls and the young ladies that you bring into her life. God, I pray that you would continue to just be able to use her to to speak life and to be that witness and be that testimony, to be able to disciple these young women in the ways of the Lord, like like we read, God, in your word. And for Father, we just pray that you would um, continue to go before them. I pray for their time here in the States, that it would continue to be fruitful, but also restful, that it would be refreshing. 
Lord, that it would be a time of you um, working in them and refreshing them as you also speak through them like you did with Kurt tonight. And, and Lord, we want to pray for Rebecca as she is taking a big step of faith to go off to college. And um, I pray, Lord, as she is um, entering into new territory and in many ways probably feeling like she's in a very foreign land. Um, God, I pray that you would um, just be working in her and through her. Lord, I pray that you would surround her with some amazing friends who just love Jesus with all of their hearts, that, that she would be able to have that really fruitful um, type of fellowship. And Lord, I also pray that the experiences that you have given her and the way and the places that she's lived and the things that she has seen and the ministry that she's been a part of that has shaped the young woman that she is, Lord, I pray that she would realize that you are placing her in that college for such a time as this, that she has a role um, in a place that you want to do um, in her life and through her life. And so, God, we pray just your blessing upon the entire Kula family, and we just thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, God bless you guys.